Okay, interesting. I didn't know if, you know, we had any intro music tonight or not. I guess, you know, our wonderful uh, <laughs> benefactor, boss, CEO, uh, A.O. Green, is, you know, he decided not to put a, you know, intro for us today. But I get enough for the music. But I get enough for the music. Yeah. <laughs> Big Al, Big Al, you don't need an introduction, man. <laughs> the people know you, man. You right, man. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I just want to thank everybody, man, for tuning into this particular episode of DEC Media. This particular broadcast would be what we call the convocation. That's when we bring all of. Uh, an assortment of members of the BEC media team to come together and tackle a topic. Usually that topic is something that is incredibly pressing and has to be addressed immediately. So it's an all-hands-on-deck type of affair for this broadcast, man. So I'm going to do some quick intros, and then we're going to dig into the purpose of the broadcast. For you guys who do not know me, my name is Elgin Bailey. I go by Big L. I am the host of DEC Radio. You can catch me on Monday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Also with me tonight, I have the host of Black Urban Apologetics. Infidisi is in the building with us, and his partner in crime, Brittany, is with us also. And we cannot forget... The, 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 the doctor, even though you probably just want to correct me for calling him doctor, we got our brother, our wonderful brother, Jose, is in the building, man. Briefly, would everybody say hello and maybe say a couple words and we'll move forward. Go ahead, DC. You started out, brother. All right. Uh, what's going on, folks? Uh, I mean, Elgin pretty much gave a pretty good introduction. Uh, I'm just looking forward to having this conversation, man. Uh I think we got. I think we got a lot to break down. And I think we're gonna cover it in some ways that uh, people ain't really, uh, people not really uh, expecting. So uh, yeah, man, I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm excited to be here. Tonight. Sure. Brittany, what's on your mind? You're next. Uh, what's good, y'all? This is Miss Brittany. I'm definitely glad to be here for this convocation with all my brothers. <laughs> um, like Miss Brittany stated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, holding it down. <laughs> um, right, but I'm definitely glad. You know, this is definitely a hot topic. You know, in social media, so I'm glad that we are tackling it from all these various perspectives. You know, apologetics, social issues. You know, with Big L, and then of course the doctor to break it all down <laughs> for us. So <laughs> definitely glad to be oh, here. Man. Yeah, that was no pressure, Jose. No pressure, brother. Yeah, <laughs> just to be clear, I am just Jose. I, I, am, I am glad to be here as well. No doctor, no MD, no PhD, no PsyD, no, none of that behind my my name. But uh, but uh, I, I appreciate the respect. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh man, loquacious Latino trying to be uh, humble. Come on, bro. He's trying, he's trying to be a little humble. Okay, okay, now. <laughs> is, it, is it working? <laughs> Yeah, not, not really. He said, is it know. working? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, tonight's topic, uh, we, we actually haven't given it to you yet, but once you hear what the topic is, you're automatically, uh, your ears should perk up, and I'm sure that you'll have some thoughts around this particular subject. The title of tonight's broadcast is called K-Dot, The Curse and the Church. Misdefining reality. Let me say it one more time for you. K dot, the curse, and the church. Misdefining reality. If anybody, I don't know where you could be living at if you did not know that uh, this week, hip hop artist Kendrick Lamar dropped a new album. Uh, the title of the album is called Damn. But in the, I, the, in the particular album, there were some things that stuck out to us that, that caught our attention right away, and that kind of leads into the purpose of this particular broadcast. The purpose of this particular broadcast is to have an open, honest, and transparent discussion about not only 
the album, but the effects of some of the things that were said on the album, the response of the body of Christ, and also the effects of this propaganda on the black church. Okay? Now let's dig right in. Let's let's talk about the actual album. DC, where, where were you when you first heard that the album dropped? What was your initial response when you heard it? Let's talk about the album. Uh, man, I was asleep. <laughs> I remember, I remember, like, cause it was, I, it was about twelve. I remember it was about twelve midnight when it dropped, and I was tired, coming off of work. I wake up six in the morning, and I see all like I'm seeing everybody blow up, talking about, oh man, uh, Kendrick the he he done woke up. I was like, woke up. I was like, I I was real confused, and then I started getting uh. I started getting messages, started getting messages, and so I started listening to the album. And I liked it. I actually liked the album as an project. I mean, I ain't got no, I don't have any issue with it. Um, it was just, I heard some things on there, and based off of my experience, I kind of, I kind of cringed up a little bit. I'm, I'm in my house, like listening to it, like I'm bumping DNA, and I was cool. Then I hit y'all, and I was like, uh. Uh, I kind of I had to stop. I had to stop for a bit. I was like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. He said that. So, I, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's basically what happened with me. I I, I kind of had a pause on it, and then I was like, uh, this is this is kind of this is kind of big because a lot of people listen to Kendrick. And when Kendrick, I ain't gonna say what Kendrick say, says goes, but you know we we kind of take what Kendrick says and then we kind of run with it. With a lot yeah, of stuff, yeah. so that's that's kind of that's kind of where I was when I heard it. Okay, okay. Now, Brit, you said you listened to a couple of the songs on the album. What was your initial thoughts when you heard the album? Uh, when I heard these few songs, definitely was not expecting this at all. Especially um, hearing the song "Humble" that came out before the album, definitely mm. was not thinking he was going to go, you know, this route with the whole Hebrew Israelite thing. So I was, I was taken by surprise. So when I heard the album, I knew the album was dropping uh, because he had dropped a couple of singles and he's one of the artists that uh, he does that whole Beyonce thing. And when I say the Beyonce thing, is truthfully, you have no idea when they're dropping an album. You don't know that they're dropping a dog on the album until the dog on the album is being played a lot of times. So he dropped a couple of singles, and it was just like, oh, okay. Then you kind of got an understanding or an idea that an album was coming because he dropped so many singles in a row. Now I woke up in the morning, and I'm like, oh, okay, and, you know, I'm going to listen to this album on my, you know, on my commute to work. And I'm just like DC. I'm listening to the album, and I'm like, man, this is good. Until I got to Yah. And once I got to the song Yah, it was just like, hmm, interesting. Because the word Yah, that title, is a, is a red flag for us. We, we know that when we hear Yah, it usually means, uh-oh. I need to pay attention closely to what's coming next. Now, what took place next was he began to talk about and mention a lot of black Hebrew Israelite rhetoric. Now, I'm going to actually have the folk from our apologetics team address the Israelite aspect. And then me and, you know, I'm going to bring Jose in, and I want him to touch on this particular song, Fear, that really resonates and had a profound or it had a lot. And I think that was the way you can find the bulk of the Hebrew Israelites rhetoric on that particular song. So so real quick, DC, break down as the best you can, man. Give the folk who may not have an understanding what the Hebrew Israelites believe. And I know that can be in, in, in depth. And just, just give them a little snippet because I want them to kind of understand why this particular album was so problematic to the body of Christ. Right. Right. 
Okay, so now for anybody who's listening, the first thing you have to realize is that just like anything within the black community, the beliefs of Hebrew Israelites are diverse, right? So not all Hebrew Israelites, a camp Israelite and a camp Israelite ideology, uh, ideologically and like someone who doesn't live in the camps, these are those are two separate those are two separate things. So when you're addressing those thought paradigms, it's all different. It's, it, you have to come at things from a different angle. So the one thing they do all agree on, however, is that Deuteronomy 28 is basically a sign that a sign for us African Americans, not just us as African Americans, but you know, some people hold to that the Native Americans and uh, you know, sometimes Puerto Ricans. Uh uh I think I wanna say the Spanish, Brittany, I don't I don't I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, it just all but, depends, like you said, on which group. So Right. Right. So in any case, in any case, yeah, it just depends on what, what type of group we're dealing with. But the, the main commonality is that, is that Deuteronomy 28, the curses, black people fit them. The reason that we're in this situation, the reason that the slave trade happened is because we broke the laws and commandments and statutes of the most high God. And because, the, because we did that, that is why we're in this situation. Right. We have tried, you know, black people have tried, you know, their movements, you know, we got the black power movement, the civil rights movement. But the reason those things didn't work was because basically God wasn't on our side. Right. As a collective, as a collective, you know, we've sinned and we are still under those curses until we come back to those commandments. Uh, And that's sort of what Carl Duckworth was saying on. And when I say commandments, I'm talking about. Some people believe it's Torah, but I think some people believe it's uh, a living out of the New Covenant. Uh, but I'm not sure. That, on that one, I, I have to admit that I'm not sure how to what extent they, since they believe there's some personal research i got to do for that. But in general, a lot of them believe you got to come back to Torah. you got to come back to living in the way that uh, you keep the old feet, you keep the feast days, that the uh, the Hebrews, the Bible keep. You keep uh, the way they wear the clothes. A lot of people, you know, they, they wear, you talk about wearing fringes, you know, you got to have, you know, if you got a beard, grow out your beard, right? <laughs> you no, know, stay away from that pork. I know y'all, I know, I know a lot of us, you know, you like, you like them ham sandwiches and them pork chops, but nah, you can't, can't do that anymore. But so it's stuff like that. It's stuff like that that we have to, uh, that we have to uh, be wary of when you're uh, dealing with Hebrew Israelites, because that's really about one of the few places that they, that camps, anybody who's an Israelite across the board, that Deuteronomy 28 is a factor. And that's why, and that's why it was important that KDOT mentioned that, because that's one thing they all agree with. Okay. Now he did on the album, he specifically said, I'm an Israelite. You know what I mean? He he made it clear. Right. I'm an Israelite, and he also stated of the the curse of Deuteronomy 28. And I don't think people really understand how that curse affects Black people specifically, because my understanding of that curse essentially means, and Brittany, correct me if I'm wrong, it means that we can do nothing to get out of our current plight in this country. That we're just stuck. Yeah, pretty much. Like you said, that God had, or Yah, or for some, the Most High, basically have us, you know, ordained to this very long cursed period. And any movement, as we see, Black Power Movement, um, Black Wall Street, any movement that Black people have tried to come together and better themselves has failed because it has not ultimately freed black people over here from being oppressed. So, yeah. Which is very problematic. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I want to bring Jose in here also. Jose, 
from a and, and I, I, I'm throwing some of the, the mental stuff at you because I know that's a field that you actually work in. Uh, so when we call you doctor, it's in jest, but recognize and appreciate that area that you're proficient in. When you have someone, a group of people who believe in curses, that basically that there's nothing they can do to get out of their current situation. What are some of the, 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 the problems that can possibly come from the people? For me, it seems like it would just be this ultimate defeatist attitude. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a defeatist attitude, but, you know, the psyche has a way of finding um, – some relief uh, when it comes to to uh, overcoming um, a personality or an, uh, an identity, rather, um, of oppression. Like, what could be more, um, you know, I read some of the lyrics, and, and, you know, Kendrick says, don't call me black, call me Hebrew Israelite, or something along those lines of paraphrasing. That's what stuck out to me the most. And... There, you know, there, there's a payoff, um, in my view, uh, to um, redefining who you are from being a black person or a black Christian or whoever, because what's the narrative for black people in this country? What's the narrative? I mean, the narrative is, is oppression, and that's something that's a really that's a really difficult thing to live with day in and day out. So. There's an ethno, I, I, I say an ethno-cultural appeal um, to moving from a black identity characterized by oppression to a Hebrew Israelite identity where you're literally moving from an oppressed identity to, to being in control of your future. The narrative literally changes. It literally changes from oppression to imminent victory. Um, and there's something to be said about that. There's something to be said about not wanting to be characterized by oppression. By oppression. Mm-hmm. Another thing I would add to that, Big L, is, is that there's an ancient appeal. Um, you know, I, my culture, it, you know, I, I, I'm Boricua, uh, most will say Puerto Rican. Um, and even within my own cultural group, um, you know, Puerto Ricans have faced a lot of oppression um, as, a, you know, as, as a people group. And there is a, a historic and ancient appeal to, 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 to become a, another um, identity. Um, some go to be becoming Taino, which is the, the original peoples of, of, of Puerto Rico. But I, the reason why I bring that up is that when you move from being black to being Hebrew Israel, Israelite, that appeal gives you something that's historic, but also fresh and new within this context. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a specialness. There's a specialness that being a Hebrew Israelite gives you a sense of acceptance by a group. Um, there's a sense of belonging to a group mm. that lives by a code, a law. Um, that's, uh, it gives you a sense of confidence that you can do right. this, that there's something very right. specific that you can do. Um, so you get that sense of confidence. There's also, I would say, um, a, a sense of equity or justice. You clearly understand why you're suffering, where in, in being black in America, if you're not woke to white yeah. supremacy, mm. It can be very vague and nebulous and, and hard to pinpoint other than your, your, the color of your skin. And that's hard to, that's hard to accept. And, that's, and, again, that identity piece, that significant piece, I'm special. I'm Hebrew mm-hmm. Israelite. Right. Wow. And it's not only that. It, you you go from, from, yeah. So it, 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 it's really easy to piggyback off of that. So, one, it's not only just the special. Like, you are the most special. Right, you are, right. you are the most chosen by God, right? It, it goes from a literal. Uh, it's a shift from a metaphorical sense in the way you know the black church. It's a sense from a from a metaphorical way that the black church has viewed themselves in comparison to the Israelites to a very literal sense. So, for Hebrew Israelites, 
a lot of them don't see it as they don't, they're not trying to do anything, right? It, it, I've had conversations with a lot of Hebrews where it's like, it's not a matter of them not trying to be out here, not trying to be out in these streets, not trying to help their people, because they're very much concerned about that. However, the solution, the solution, we can't get out of the curses until we get back to these laws and commandments, period, as a collective. Until we get back to these laws and commandments, it's always going to be like this. So it's it's almost right. like it's almost like a very – so I would say, look, Switch out going to church. Let's say you're a heavy church goer, right? And you go to all the you go to all the Bible studies, you go to all the Easter Sundays, you go, you know, Christmas, you setting up all these programs. So throw all that out. Throw all that out, all the pagan holidays, you know. So there ain't no more Christmas, ain't no more it depending on how people believe, ain't no more Easter. You know what I mean? You have to do stuff from the Hebraic perspective, the way God called it. To be, and that's how they, and that's how they view the movement, the the action, right. the work that we have to do. To let me add something to what, to what you're just saying there, uh, DC is, is that literally, if you're if you rem- remain black, and let's just say black Christian, because I, I I I tend to think probably most of these folk are coming from Christianity. Um, mm-hmm. Where, where's the, where's, it's more of the same if you don't make that change. It's like you don't know where um, the way out is. It's, it's literally the church, the institutional church, has not really cleared a path to victory um, that, that is palpable for the black Christian. And I think that this shift from to Hebrew – Israel, this Hebrew Israelite shift is a literal change in the narrative. And as you said, DC, what, so well, it moves from being special to being the most special. You're, re, you're literally renouncing oppression and you're taking on a clear, palpable path to victory. And that's, that's through living in a certain way, um, the Torah, the law, how, whatever you want to call it. Right. I would agree. Why don't you go ahead and add on to that, Brittany? Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Oh, but yeah, I disagree with what Jose was saying, as in turning the table of oppression. When you think about blacks here in America, you know, always deemed as inferior, less than. You know, we had a law that. You know, when we first came here, we were property, you know, then became three-fifths, and then we were freed, and then we finally became citizens. So uh, this whole storyline, you know, of oppression, it's really turning the tables on that and saying that, you know, those white people up over there in Israel today, you know, they, they paint this picture of, you know, the Bible being Eurocentric, but really we are the people that the Bible is speaking about. We are the Israelites. You know, so you go from what has, you know, been placed at the bottom to, t- you know, to the top in a sense. And definitely picking back off of what DC was saying, as in, you know, here at DEC, you know, to fight white supremacy, you know, we say economics, uh, education, various sorts of things in their way, in a sense, to fight oppression is just returning back to the laws. So, in a sense, they're not really fighting oppression. So, And it's, to, to me, when I hear them say things like return back to the law, it's, it's, it's a very double-minded, double-tongued thought process. Because in one direction, you're telling me not to do anything. But on the other side, you're telling me that I need to do something to get to a place where I don't have to do anything. It's really convoluted and confusing. And what I've noticed, family, is the fact of this movement, this thing, this this Israelite Hebrew thing is booming all of a sudden. I mean, I live here in Philly, and there's this one strip, this one street that is well-known 
it's, if you're going to go shopping here, you always have to be in mind that you're going to be harassed by the Israelites it's somehow, some way. Either they're going to be mm. passing out pamphlets or they're going to be with the megaphone talking about white devils and doing all this stuff things. But from now all through my community, black Hebrew Israelites are everywhere. I mean, yeah. it is everywhere. And I think that's one of the most problematic, dangerous things about what Kendrick did on this album. Now, he has the freedom of expression to say what he believes and what his belief system is on his records. But still, Absolutely. nonetheless, no one can actually take away the dangerous propaganda because that's what it is. It's propaganda that's put on there. But where did this rise of like Hebrew Israelites come from all of a sudden? What in the world has caused this rise of the Hebrew Israelites to just boom the way it's booming now? What in the world happened? Uh, Anybody. Uh, Anybody. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, this is I would just say it like it is. This is um, th- these are black people, and a black church is responsible for, for for black people, and that's how I, that's how I've always viewed it. And so this is our fault, like because as a whole, as a whole, I'm not now to be clear before I start, but for somebody listening, like oh you know you don't like you don't like uh, black churches, institutional churches. I go to a church <laughs> down in DC. I go to a church down in D.C., and I know that a lot of my members, until I brought it home, right, they didn't know about it. They didn't know about it. The pastor knows about it, but not everybody else knows about it. Why is that? Because a lot of times you have people who are sitting there in the pews. You know, you you might have people, like, that aren't really interested, don't see the need to address these type of things. Or you have the people, you even got them in D.C. You got people on the streets that are down there in D.C. that that uh, promote that, right? You got IUIC camps down in D.C. You have, we, have, we had IUIC uh, camps. There's an IUIC camps in the DMV area, just period. So for us, I think that we're not dealing, a lot of times you can't find a church that deals with this whole racism that we see in America. Like, oh, man, I, I don't have the answers, and I don't really see the church doing anything. So when a black church Christian comes along, it's like, hey, wait a minute, hold on. Now, we have people that dealt with this stuff in the past. It's just a lot of us don't know about it. I think it's the fault of us not systematically educating uh, the people. Now, I'm sorry to say it, but we got a lot of jack leg preachers out there, a lot of jack leg bootleg preachers just trying to get a quick buck just trying to have some sort of influence over people where they don't really care about the black community or even how to overcome the racism, right? How to overcome the white supremacy, the ideology, you know, how to, how to overcome these situations like people got to face on their job. Right. And I think it's so important for the black church to say to black people, this is not your fault. There's like, nothing that you did that makes them like this. Right. God isn't like sitting there like, and you guys are not obedient enough, so I'm going to send these white people down your neck to to basically punish y'all until y'all want to act right. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. We understand. We understand. You understand white supremacy. You understand. You see it. You see how the rules change for black people all the time in this country. And a black church ought to be on the forefront and have a prophetic voice into how to deal with these issues, right? How to how to be a solution and a light to progress against those issues. You can't say you can't and that and, and I'm gonna pass it off to you, Brittany, after I say this. You can't go to a Hebrew and say you're not cursed and not understand white supremacy. Because you don't because automatically with that, they are they automatically know, oh, you don't even care about the black community. And that's the perception you got to deal with, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. That's what. That's why. That's why when you get 
some people are like, oh, well, you know, how do you explain the fact that, you know, we got all this police brutality and all this stuff and, you know, we got all these problems in the community. You know, what you mean we're not, what do you mean we're not cursed, right? If you, it's usually folks that have been so well taught, not well taught by white supremacy, but so familiar with it. I'm so used to seeing this stuff, this cycle. It's like a, it's like I just got to the point where, man, God must have a reason for, for this. So that that that's what I think. You can go ahead and take that, Brittany. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, the black church has not highlighted and fully broken down and analyzed, you know, the effects of systematic white supremacy that even, you know, affects the view of the black church as being second mm. class. So, you know, and we don't really have examples out there of, you know, being Christian and being able to embrace, you know, blackness, to embrace your African identity. If it is done, you know, it's labeled uh, liberation theology or, you know, some type of social justice warrior. So the space hasn't been allowed that this good news that was supposed to go out to every nation, tribe, and tongue, you know, when people express their, you know, faith in God through their ethnic mm-hmm. identity, you know, it's silenced or, you know, hey, let's focus on the gospel. But they never really say, okay, what is the gospel? You know, it's like, you know, it's like sit down and be quiet. So uh, with the whole ethnic idea why this album from Kendrick is so problematic because, you know, the the black church has been silent and this black Hebrew Israelite which movement which has been seen and heard, you know, like you said, on the street corner, you pass by their schools and, you know, while you're driving through the neighborhood, social media uh, platforms, you know, but now you're having on a mass scale someone talking about heritage, something that is you know, not talked about in the black church. Now you have these black Hebrew Israelites talking about heritage. So it's going to be very, you know, very, very appealing, you know, even though Kendrick doesn't go into the uh, details of how dangerous this mentality is when essentially you're saying that black people are responsible for, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and what happened uh, during slavery and Jim Crow, you know. So, and then also, just another another social issue um, outside of ethnic identity, the black Hebrew Israelites, they really esteem black males. So, you know, in the black church, sometimes you have where it's basically like a woman's club, you know, and the only males you have are, is the pastor and the elders, and then you have all these women and children. And then, you know, you may have a brother who is an usher. So really the only men esteemed in church, you know, biblical manhood is, you know, if you're a preacher, preacher in training, or, you know, an usher. So, you know, with men not being, biblical manhood not being esteemed all throughout the church, however a man, you know, serves God, you know, the Hebrew Israelites, they, you know, uh, they fill that gap that the church has failed to feel. So now you have these men who are, you know, it's your responsibility to lead your family, you know, your responsibility for the protection and the providing of not only your family, but the community and of these laws, you know. So it's various factors, you know, but ultimately it's, you know, various factors that the black church has uh, failed to do. Yeah. And I think the one thing is, Jose, because I want to get your uh, your thoughts on this aspect. The, the, the black church specifically, we're going to just talk about that for just a moment, has, for whatever reason, since the civil rights movement, been incredibly reactive. We have not been nearly as proactive to social ills and things that are going on in our community. Uh, just in your opinion, just some of your thoughts, what could be some of the reasons why 
and not only the reasons why, but some of the dangers of the church not being proactive. Oh, man, that's such a big question. I mean, so many layers to that. Uh, You know, when you're reactive, I I almost envision, and just, you know, from my experience um, and being uh, a part of several different types of churches um, that have a common thread of being reactionary, it's because they're not really – they're the best – they're trying to hold on. Um, Resources can be very challenging in our community. Um, And so, like, even if the, you know, your instinct is to do something, even if you're the kind of person who's looking for opportunities to be proactive, you're limited by your resources. And so, you know, and and I think this is a small percentage, uh, at least that's my opinion, of people who want to address certain issues proactively um, th- those are already a small percentage of the of of the rest, but then the reality of the resources is just not there. Um, so what are you left? What are you left to do? You're you're left to be there to hang on to ride it out to survive. Thriving's not thriving's not uh, pro- a priority um, when you're barely keeping the lights on. You know. And that's not just the reality of the, you know, if you leave, if you leave, you're looking at that as, you know, as the reality of the institutional church within the black collective of the, the, the mm-hmm. limited resources. Um, but then you, you take and you follow those people home. The, mm-hmm. For the most part, you're seeing that there too. So mm-hmm. I'm not so sure that it's necessarily, um, you know, a failure of the black church, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very hesitant to say that because mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. that the effects of white supremacy has really mm-hmm. crippled the, the ability for the black collective to be proactive in this. Um, mm. So, you know, basics of survival, you have to take care of the physical needs. You have to take care of them to being able to survive thriving. That's, that's, that's not even in the picture for most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I absolutely agree with that. I know for a long period of time I was a uh, real staunch uh, defender and fighter against the prosperity gospel that I just, the prosperity gospel always has made my skin crawl and just had me incredibly angry. But then I began to look at the socioeconomic status and state of my community. The prosperity gospel makes perfect sense. It, it makes complete ah, sense. It is nothing yeah. more than a spiritual lottery. It's, it's, that's all it is. It makes perfect sense. But here's where one of the issues is, is the fact that the church has a real difficult time because of white supremacy. And because of the effects of white supremacy, unfortunately, defining reality. So many of the sermons and teachings that we hear every Sunday are no more than behavioral modification, just enough to get you motivated to make it to the next day. But it's not giving you enough to be able to actually make it through the week, if that makes sense. It hasn't done what it needed to do in defining reality. So you will hear very few, and this, let me go ahead and put this disclaimer out there for people real quick, please. (laughs) This is not an attack on the church. This is not an attack against the institutionalized church. This is not a a bashing of the church. But this is just stating, unfortunately, many sermons that we hear and it's not even, again, I think that has also been touched by white supremacy hands. I think white supremacy's fingerprints is even all the terms of the teachings that are given out. Because with white supremacy was not there, we would be able to give everyday life-sustaining sermons and teachings. But I think because yeah. of the way white supremacy has tainted our view, it's been really difficult. So I have a really hard time coming down on congregants, 
church members yeah. who buy into the prosperity gospel. Now, the people who, yeah. who are in leadership, because I think some of them are intentionally doing it, I have a hard time. It's just like it's changed my thought process. But that lack of the church, the finding reality, I think is a major issue beyond music and this particular album. Anybody got any thoughts they want to add to that? I know I said a lot just now. Yeah, I, 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 go ahead, Brittany. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I just want to put out there, we are not um, tearing down the church. We are a part of, a part of the body of Christ, you know. So we Amen. see these problems, Amen. and we're calling them out because they need to be fixed. So we're calling them out because we love the church. You know, we have been, you know, commanded due to our allegiance to Christ to love the church. So these problems that we're highlighting, we're not bashing the church, you know, because we're actually trying to do something about it. So... I just want to throw that yeah. out there. No, that's real. No, that's real. Like, uh, like I tell people, like, you know, I deal with a lot of people on through Facebook. So I still go to church, y'all. Like, I'm not <laughs> not some random, like, not some random church dude who ain't trying to do nothing for his, for his community or just, like, just out here just talking reckless just because. No, I think that for us as a black church that we – have struggled with systematic education of mm, mm, Christians here mm, of our own history and Christianity. Mm, if we had just, if people, if we just knew what we contributed in the States, things would be entirely different. And because we don't know, because we don't know, like, for example, people don't know that black people, the whole liberation theology that came out because of James Cone, James Conant isn't a well-known person in black churches. That's not a well-known name. You can go down to a church down in D.C. and you'll never talk about. You'll never. You'll never hear sermons. And not to say churches ain't doing it. Not to say people ain't doing it. It's not prevalent though. It's not that propaganda. We don't have that propaganda circulating through our communities. We don't have that type of language being spoken. Right. We don't have people. We don't have and. To even make it more clear, you do have Christians that speak against white supremacy, right? You have Lecrae, right? We had Lecrae in the mainstream yeah. talking about man what these white people ain't doing. Y'all, you, you know, y'all, y'all want me, y'all want me to share the gospel, but y'all don't want me to talk about how y'all, how y'all basically are complicit in all this stuff that happens to black folks on a daily basis. Y'all not, y'all don't even That's come from true. my experience. So how could y'all? Co- how could y'all even understand? Y'all couldn't possibly understand. And that again, right. that's what it, that's the that's the danger in a black Christian going up to a Hebrew Israelite talking about, man, man, it's not cursed. We're not cursed. Like it, it like you can't you can't like say that without addressing white supremacy, right? We can't say that. <laughs> there's no way you can uh, there's no way we can talk about this stuff and not be well educated on white supremacy and the effects that it's had on the church. Right. So, you know, you know what, we come off as like, yo, y'all, y'all, y'all them angry black folks and y'all, you know, y'all, man, y'all those folks that, uh, you know, y'all deviating away from the gospel to get free and y'all trying to live like pagans and stuff like that. It's not even about that. It's about, (laughs) it's not even about that. It's that the principle of the kingdom of God is against oppression. Right. We're, it's totally against that. We're not talking about oppressing people. You got Hebrew Israelite camps that talk about that. That they're gonna have white folks up in they gonna have white folks up in heaven, you know, they're gonna be the slaves. They got some scriptures that go, that go into that, but the point is that, that that's not what we're advocating. What we advocate is what you can what we can do as a as black people to get out of their situation. Right, and we need to communicate. The black church has to commu- communicate and propagate a theology and ideo- ideology that promotes activism, not pacifism or victim blaming. You don't blame rape victims for being raped. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can okay, I add something to that? To Absolutely. I want to. I want to hear your thoughts definitely. Yeah. Uh, so you know, 
I don't want to I don't want to let the black you know I don't want to let let the black church completely off the hook because although we are challenged with our resources, although you know there are a lot of things that you know we face on a daily on a daily basis, it don't cost anything to you know inspire, encourage, and 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 to teach your folk how to navigate this system of white supremacy. That doesn't right. cost them any money. Um, it doesn't cost us anything to encourage our people to embrace their blackness, to know who they are, and 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 that they don't have to go running after, you know, different kinds of ideologies that that quite frankly come against um, the core of who we are as a, a black collective. For example, you right. brought up the prosperity gospel in the system of white supremacy. For a black person to 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 let's just say to navigate their way um, and, and to fully actualize the vision of a prosperity gospel, in a lot of ways they have to denounce who they are as a black person. They have right. to become more individualistic. Black peoples tend to be more communal. Black peoples tend to congregate with each other, to lean on each other. Now I know white supremacy has done a good job on on breaking that down, but, but why do you, let me, let me put you, let me put it this way. The Hebrew Israelites are coalescing people. We may not like what they stand for. We may not like uh, what their, you know, the, what their uh, beliefs are, but look what they're trying to do. Look who they're, Absolutely. look who they're gathering together. They're gla- gathering together African descendants, Hispanics, Latinos, whatever you want to call it, uh, exactly. Native Americans, those kinds of people. They're, they're, they're really pushing an ideolo- ide- ideology of community, even though sure. it's not what we stand for. And the black church can certainly speak up against that. And, and, and here's, here's something even bigger, and I absolutely agree with you. When this album dropped, when this album dropped and a bunch of – Black Christian people who like hip hop listen to this album. I think their dreams and thought process of who Kendrick Lamar was was shattered. I think the one of the reasons why there's been such an outcry and such a a, a, a a denouncing of who he is is because a lot of black Christians are butthurt based off of what Kendrick put out in this album. Because on his last album, and the album before that, Sepimple Butterfly, and the album before that, Good Child Mad City, he had many albums where, many songs where he mentioned quote-unquote Christian-type words and propaganda mm. thoughts and cliches. So what happened mm. was, many black Christians bought into this idea or assumed this idea that he was a believer. So when he put out these albums, there were all these debates that went on whether Kendrick Lamar was a believer and follower of Christ. So you had all of these people accept him into the body. But here's what the problem lies. When Lecrae, Christian Gray, Mally Music, Jafile Life, Show yeah. and a host of other black Christian artists decide to say, hey, listen, I'm tired of going to preaching and singing and performing in churches for youth groups. I want to take this message out to the world, to the people who look just like me and actually need Jesus. Black Christians, yeah. in large part, did not and will not accept what they're trying to do. So for years now, ever since Lecrae put out the Jesus Music album, he has been torn down, attacked, derailed in so many ways because he said, God told me to be light in darkness. So I'm going to continue to make gospel-centered music for everyone to know that there's hope. Now what he changed was He went from the fact that every verse was not a scripture. It wasn't a verse like the Reformed Rappers, Cross Movement, and so on, were consistently known for putting theology in his raps. He stopped doing that. So when he stopped doing that, black Christians turned their back on him. But we're so quick to elevate and look and accept 
people of the world, but when people who are just like us have a passion and fervor for the Lord, want to go out and evangelize and live a gospel-centered, focused, Christ-centered life in darkness, we call their faith, we call their salvation in question. Like literally. Every time. Every time. In question. (laughs) And it, it blows my mind how we want to argue about Kendrick's and, and a bit being a part of the body, but we're kicking people out of the body who say they're in it but want to go and evangelize to the world. It makes no sense. Me, man, listen, man, listen. Let me. It, 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 this is a key difference between the narrative of black church people and the narrative of black church people and the narrative the Hebrew Israelites are bringing. The narrative that they bring in, we're militant, right? We're, 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 about, we're about getting out of this problem, right? The narrative we have is that, oh, all we got to do is believe in Jesus and you're going to be blessed. That's it. Hold on. That's all we, yeah, hold on, <laughs> hold on. We wait on till Jesus, we wait till Jesus come back, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Now, if you're really paying attention to the doctrine of Deuteronomy 28, which is a false interpretation, that's a, that's a covenant for ancient Israel, which was 3,000 years ago, and some of them curses already been completed. We can already show that those curses aren't we – can, we can basically show those curses aren't even all that unique, right? Not even to that – not even just to the Israelites. We can, we can show – different treaties in that time in the ancient near east where that's been done right all that's been all of that was completed all of that like that that's part that's part of how um how do you call a suzerain vassal treaty right you have you have people uh basically make a, a pact a communion with you know uh, a lord or another state and they, if you if you do this, we're gonna make sure you're protected. If you don't do this, these things are gonna to happen to you, right? And then the person that initiated the treaty, the person that made the contract, the god or the god, the deity, they are obligated to bring about those quote unquote curses. And you can go through, you can go through uh, the Old Testament and show where those things are periodically fulfilled. Right, and then some of that stuff, the culmination of those curses being fulfilled in 70 A.D. Right, the culmination of all of that. But the point is, people don't know that. Right, that's not com- is that common knowledge? Like, if I didn't no. say that right now, wouldn't anybody know no. that? Is the black church no. teaching that? No, no. <laughs> the black church isn't teaching that. You don't. So the only thing that I, I know from my own experience. The black church was was slash is about a fight. You the glory in being black, the the pride in being black and fight and and being a Christian is that you're engaged in the fight against oppression. You've been through it. So automatically you're called to be a part of the revolution, right? And I would rather honestly, I would rather for myself, my mentality is I would rather stand up die and fight fighting for what's right instead of living under a system where i can't even live if i'm going to die if i'm going to live a, a if i'm going to live a poor life anyway i might as well fight against it i might as well i mean there's no there's <laughs> you know, if there's nothing i can do that's right according to the powers that be then i might as well go ahead and fight cuz i don't have any other choice I'm in between a rock and a hard place. But that narrative is different with the Hebrews, right? So because that narrative is different, that's why you get those young men, right? That's why you get those women. That's why, that's why they're so focused. Because they're, they're, what a lot of people don't tell you is, a lot of apologetic shows don't deal with is that they're very focused on their families, right? They're very, yeah. Yeah. They're very family-centered. They're very much about fixing that problem of, Man, the dad got to be the dad. You got to be in the home. You got to take care of your kids, right? You got to you gotta be that man. You got to follow that law of being there for your child, 
right? You have to do that. And then you have to order your family in such a way where you are obedient to the most high God, right? Now, that ain't to say that everybody's doing it right, that we agree with everybody. Obviously not. But these people are trying to do work in their own way, right? And the black, and then those of us that don't want to be out in those streets, you don't want to, you don't want to go out there. You don't want to talk to the people. You don't want to get out of the pews. You kind of just want to go to church every Sunday. You don't want to go to Bible study. If you don't want to do all that, then this ain't, you can't reach these people. You can't, you can't talk. It's not even just these people that you can't reach, but you're not ready to equip uh, the collective with something that everybody can work with, right? You're not, you're not, you're not really in the fight. You're not engaged yourself and you have to, you have to examine yourself and see, okay, where am I at and why, what am I not doing? What can I do to help? There's some serious self-examination that I think people have to take into account when they deal with that stuff. I know I said a lot there, but. Yeah, you, I mean, I think the one aspect before we transition a little bit is I want to ask get Brittany and Jose to chime in. And it's a broad question, but I want them to give their thoughts, man, on what can the church do to address this particular issue? Uh, I think that's really, really important to just be able to, because we highlighted the failures. We highlighted where they've gone wrong, but what can the actual body of Christ do in face of this? Because what I'm not seeing, and to be honest with you, I'm not seeing white evangelicals worried about Kendrick Lamar's out. Just, 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 <laughs> just to be honest with you. White oh, evangelicals man. are not caring about the fact that Kendrick Lamar dropped his album. That they don't care. Black church is up in arms. Black folks are dealing with this. Jose, Brittany, what can the church do to address this issue? Anybody? Take it. Take it. Run with it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was on mute. Uh, Brittany, did well, you want to say anything before I jump in? Or uh, No, go ahead. You can start out. Okay. So, you know, here, here's my thing. Um, I, I believe wholeheartedly that it's an unnecessary jump for a Christian um, to move from Christianity to Hebrew Israelite ideology. I just don't, you know, as you know, as, from my perspective, more of the ethnocultural aspect, um, you know, there's so many things wrong with it biblically, theologically, that DC can probably break it down um, a lot better than I can. He's probably studied this a lot more than, than I have. But I think that, that one of the solutions, one of the things that we can do is to, is to go back to our roots. Um, the church has not, and, and I've been in church for a very long time, um, and I've never, ever heard anyone ever encourage me to study the African context of of the Bible, that the that that Christianity um, is an African spirituality, um, because this, here's why this is important. This is important because people don't understand that who they are, their identity, that there is that there is something beautiful and powerful about blackness and how and who we are within that context that we don't need to go running after identities that have ethnocultural appeal. We don't have to sit there and envision and dream about becoming something we're not. We just need to become who we are. We just need to go back and, and study and learn and understand that who we are is more than enough. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think that what, what we call that is indigenous Christianity. 
and I think we can break that down a little bit for you. Um, Brittany, you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, so definitely um, we see that it's a identity issue that's taking place, and it not only needs to be highlighted in the pulpit, but definitely at home on a daily basis. And that's definitely right. um, something that the Hebrew Israelites, you know, definitely um, utilize, is embracing uh, this heritage on a daily basis. But getting back to um, indigenous Christianity, in order to understand Christianity, we have to understand and realize the people, you know, that God utilized to bring this forward with. And we need to get back to really looking at um, the indigenous perspective, looking at this historical narrative of the Bible where we see God communicating his divine principles to these various people groups, and they are maintaining these principles as they go, you know, throughout all these changes politically, socially, you know, they maintain these core principles, even though the externals may change, such as with the Israelites. Before captivity, they had the temple, you know, where they would go and worship corporately. And, of course, in captivity, they transitioned to the synagogue. So we see that core principle of corporate worship of community being maintained, but it's yeah. adaptive to the situation. So um, definitely. And uh, I think the big thing is that communal aspect. I think that would help to solve this whole identity crisis um, and remembering that, you know, Trying to think of the word to say it. Um, yeah, but Jose, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I think she said that really well, and I, and I would I would I would really stress that we're not talking about um, going becoming uh, you know like like what the Hebrew we don't we don't want to re- replicate what the Hebrew Israelites are doing by going back and trying to follow the Torah and and the law and all of that. You know, I I see that as not only not biblical, but wholly unnecessary. You know, there's something within indigenous Christianity. We follow a concept called Sankofa, which literally means to go back and get it. It's an, it's an Akan um, uh, idea. It comes from the Akan peoples. It's a, it's a, a Dinkra symbol. It's a, literally a picture of a bird that is moving forward with its, with its uh, head looking back with an egg in it, the egg symbolizing the future of what's to come the, the this bird is moving forward but it's but but it's looking backwards and so looking backwards yeah. in order to understand the past in order to understand your history in, in order to understand where you where you've coming where you where you come from and taking from that the wisdom and the best of what was before, uh, you know, behind us and moving forward to progress into the future. Guys, we really don't need to, 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 uh, again, looking back, moving forward and adapting to the situation we're in. And this thing right. that we really need to be able to thrive in using that word is, is a system of white supremacy. We need that indigenous Christianity to give us that identity and that live it, that edge in order to move forward into the future. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We, have a, we have a caller that's going to join us, man, a, a good brother of BEC Media. I'm going to bring him on the line, man, to have him share his overall thoughts on the Kendrick Lamar situation. He's a knowledgeable brother in regards to black Hebrew Israelites. You know, his his actual family has ties to the black power movement out in Cali. So he's going to be able to give us some insight. We got the brother Isaiah West on the line with us. Brother, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we hear you loud and clear, man. Welcome to the convocation, brother. I hope all is well with hey, you and the family. Yeah, everything's going well, man. Glad to be here, man. You know, sure, glad to be here and hear you all and listening in on the conversation. 
Go ahead. We'll, we'll jump right in, man. Share your overall thoughts of the Kendrick Lamar album dropping, the, the he words of like propaganda. Give us what's on your mind. Well, I, I didn't hear, know anything about the Kendrick Lamar album until a couple of weeks ago uh, when I was getting my hair cut and my barber happened to be listening to it. And I guess, you know, it's all the, you know, the barbershop is the local community, you know, information center. So you find out everything when you're getting a haircut. And that's when I first began to hear about it. And um, the first thing, you know, when I started finding out what the album was about and some of the messages that were on there, like, in fact, I had a talk with somebody today about his uh, song, Humble, or whatever it is. And I, I just said to myself, well, you know, music is the most powerful medium of communication that we have in the world. And so if you're going to get a message across like that, the music would be the easiest way to do it. And I, I, just, I said to myself right then that this is going to have some tangible impact on the black community. It won't affect the white community at all. That was one thing that I did tell someone who asked me about it. I said it won't affect them at all uh, because these things are targeted at us directly but it, it will have an impact because just because of who he is, people are going to listen intently. And there are some that are going to begin to change their opinion about, you know, what they believe. And there are others that are going to be turned off from him because they thought maybe he was a believer or something else. But, you know, the music is going to, is going to, is going to galvanize that movement a little bit more just because he's a major star that has now put his faith out there on the forefront. And other people, other uh, people in the uh, spotlight who have also converted to that particular faith, you know, they've been doing the same thing. And you've been, and this, but they've been primarily doing it on social media. So I think this is the first time you've had a major um, celebrity that has done it in something like a recording like this. I think one of the things that I find interesting, though, like I said, I don't know how many of you guys, man, are uh, <laughs> hip-hop heads who've been listening to hip-hop for years. I am one of those people. Um, I'm a hip-hop head. I've been listening to hip-hop since I don't know when. But hip-hop artists or artists in general have been known for years to put their religious ideology within the musical context. All throughout the 90s, you had groups as Wu-Tang Clan and Public Enemy and a host of others who have put their religious ideology front and center in their music in hip-hop. It's not new. It's not new at all. So the question that I have, and I had to think about is, why is this such a big deal now? Why is it such a big deal, and why is it so problematic at the moment? Anybody can grab that question. Reason, I, 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 ahead, I'll sorry. answer it like this. The reason why I think it's problematic now is because in the past, when you had public enemy, Wu-Tang Clan, poor righteous teachers, um, mm. you know, the New Wabians with the, um, one of the brothers from De La Soul, and other groups mm. of this sort, you had you had these different eclectic beliefs, such as the Nation of Islam, the Five Percenters, the Nuwabians, and all these other and all these other beliefs. But the Hebrew Israelite movement has been around for quite some time, but a lot of people just didn't know about it. But it's been around for quite some time. It's actually been around since the 19th century, but it just wasn't Absolutely. well known. And, and so. What's happened now is, though, because of the continuation of racism in this mm. country mm. And, and America's blatant disregard for actually doing anything about it. I mean, we just elected, you know, this guy. I don't want to say his name, but... Agent Orange. You know, yeah. you just... Yeah, you know, all those other philosophies that were talked about before you know, they we knew about them already because you had the Nation of Islam and, and um, the Five Percenters, you know, going all the way back to the 50s and 60s and things of this sort, and, and the Nuwabian movement, which, you know, went back to the, into the 70s. 
and and things of this sort. It, they really didn't didn't have an impact. And then the Nation of Islam seemed so radical to some people, they just weren't ready to go into that in that regard. Even though they respected Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, who was once a member, and they still respect Minister Farrakhan. You know, they didn't want to. They didn't get into those movements, in particular with the Nation of Islam, because it seemed like you were more or less following a man. And as much as some of the Nation of Islam people may deny it, it was just too similar to what some folks who have been in church all their life were used to, following another man like a pastor, you know, or some kind of bishop or, or, or whatnot, and they didn't want to go into that. With the Hebrew-Israelite movement, you know, you got all these little, these different camps and things of this sort, you know, and... In, in some regard, you know, you don't have to, so, so to speak, go and pay homage to some particular individual or person, but they put more emphasis on what they're teaching rather than on who's teaching. In all these other movements, there has always had to be a central figure. Somebody always had to stand at the center to give that movement legs. And so you always had mm-hmm. these, per, these persons or people that you went back to. In this particular movement, People just say, no, man, it's all God. I go back to the scriptures. You know, and right. so, you know, it's a, it's, like I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different presentation. And then considering right. the times that we're living in, a lot of Bible prophecy lines up to these times. And so they see the plight of American blacks in the West in that same prophetical context, or prophetic context, rather. I say prophetical, that's not even a word. <laughs> prophetic context. And so they're trying to find, they're still doing the same thing. The whole reason the movement started was because black people were trying to find themselves and explain why the things that were happening to them were, and a way to find, make themselves feel, feel special. And so this is the same mm-hmm. thing that's still being done. You know, and, it, right. and like I said, because we've been mistreated for so long, out of all those other philosophies, this one sounds more believable to anybody than the other because the solution for the Nation of Islam was that a giant spaceship is going to come and destroy the earth. And, and, and you know, and so people are no. like, oh, that's sci-fi. We want something that right. seems more spiritually tangible. And so with this, you got a Bible, you have the book. You know, because that spaceship, that mothership theory, that's not written in any literature. Elijah Muhammad made that whole yeah. thing up. Right. Because he's not. Right. And now, uh, the only <laughs> thing I'd like to add to that is this. What I'd like Go to ahead. add to that is this. Now, when they, when they, and we're talking about perceptions, right? Now, now what you, now what you mentioned, it's really, it's really about how they're, how the whole Hebrew Israelite black on the black side movement. Right, it's perceived. Right, that's it, it's perceived as like, okay, we're all following God. We're all talking about keeping the commandments, talking about uh, all these different things. But now, and I'm gonna tell y'all this. First of all, only the white people really just focus on the camps. That's it. Other than that, yeah, they don't talk about they don't talk about the Israel of God Church that also hosted at Deuteronomy 28. You don't talk about you don't talk. About other Israelites that are teaching different things. So when I was saying that these people are diverse, that's one of the things. And when you're studying these, when you're studying the people, right, you're studying the ideology, right, you notice that a lot of these people, they still following men, right? You got, you got old boy uh, from ISUPK, Captain uh, Cesariak, uh, you got him, you got him. They, he got a whole crew of folks. They just following him where he say what where he say go and they all and they can all if he went down somebody else would come up and take his place right and what a lot of people don't realize is that for the black community that was sort of that's sort of the answer that we have to do that we have to come upon in terms of coming up out of the situation which is what a lot of our revolutionary leaders focused on it wasn't about they were they weren't trying to get us to follow them. They were trying to get us to see that it's about the community having that same understanding, right? And if we as people, as the upcoming leaders, don't teach that to our brethren, our brethren and our sisters, that this is about us getting it, not the leader getting it, because they can't kill. <laughs> what are they gonna do? Kill all of you? They're not gonna kill. That's not gonna happen. That's not, that's not going to happen because 
can you can outthink you can outthink the enemy. And I think that it was something uh Kwame Sare said in uh Black Power, the politics of liberation. Getting black people to understand that they can do things for themselves is a revolutionary idea. Because a lot of times we don't believe we can do things for ourselves. And I think that's where the whole, I think that's where the crux of the issue is, is that we as a community, we don't understand the ideologies behind our, what our movements were about, right? We see the effects of integration and we see the negativity, but we don't see what they were trying to get. So right. they, don't, they, don't, they don't see that community. So go ahead, Brittany. Right. Yeah, I was just going to um, definitely agree with what you said and piggyback off of what our caller, Mr. Isaiah, was talking about, this time that we're in now. You think about the Trump election, all these shootings we see on TV, you know, all these, you know, senseless cop killings. You know, you just yeah. steady see black people suffering. So this message, it speaks to what we are seeing on a daily basis. You know, every other day, seeing the killing of a black man or woman, you know, all this stuff that comes out. So it speaks to this this desperation for an answer, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. of the fear of the blackness that I'm in always equates to something negative. It's always a tragedy that's taking place in our community. And the, and the uh, black Hebrew Israelites, they are now coming with this, with what they believe is the answer, as we are cursed. So I believe it's really taking a hold, and you not only see it with, um, you know, I won't say you're, you know, the listeners, uh, I won't say the average person, but I guess you could say the average person, but even in the middle class now, you know, you mm-hmm. got Amari mm-hmm. Stoudemire, you got Chingi, mm-hmm. who is the Israelite, you got... Um, I believe India Irie, she's trying to come out with an English and a Hebrew album. So what? you see it picking up now. It's not just, yeah. So it's not just the uh, this poor man's rhetoric, but now it's moving up. So it's really um, mm-hmm. capturing the minds of people. So. And I think one of the big problems and one of the, the reasons why it's so able to be uh, prominent now is because I believe that the black church specifically in this part of the conversation has failed to affirm blackness, that mm-hmm. they have not done what they possibly Amen. should have done to affirm mm-hmm. blackness. And when I say affirm blackness, affirming blackness doesn't mean that we have to walk around with, with kente cloth on our back to hold on on time. It can just mean the same fact, though, you allowing me to be comfortable in my blackness. That when you Walk create an environment, RDG. exactly with an RDG flag hanging out my back pocket, <laughs> you know what I mean. You allow me to enjoy and to have a safe place where I can bring everyday black issues. And I think a lot of that has to do. And hey, Jose, I want you to jump in here. Is with the fact that we have failed to properly communicate racism, white supremacy, that we still dress racism, white supremacy up in pretty terms such as minority, uh, diversity, Mm -hmm. or one of my all-time favorites here lately is white privilege. You know, we continue to dress it up and make it palatable when we don't address the harsh realities of what racism, white supremacy is currently doing. What do you think? Yeah, Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that. I think that we need to be truthful. Uh, we have to prepare people for re- the re- the reality that they're living every day. You know, when you don't address the reality people are living every day, they're going to get answers from some place. <laughs> you want to? You talked about. You just spoke before about yeah. being proactive. You want to be proactive. Be proactive in preparing your people for the reality that they're living. You know, and. And not only that, give them that sense of pride that comes from being who they are. You know, you, yeah. you talk about identity is a powerful thing. Identity is what protects people from outside influences, you know, and so uh, things that, that seek to cause them harm. Identity is what 
is what people really need. And who better to give it, you know, to 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 our people than us? You know, don't let white, you know, don't let the outsiders define our reality. We know what we're living every day, and we have Christ. You know, and, and we have our culture, you know, and, and I'm going to add this piece. You know, I know everybody joke around calling me the loquacious Latino. I'm going to add this piece. Uh, <laughs> plug, plugging this uh, is really important to me. You know, I think that because we live in – living in the United States, we live in a black and white racial binary. And True. And that causes us to leave out a huge segment – of the black collective that who are also experiencing identity issues, who are also experiencing uh, racism, who are also experiencing, um, you know, the effects of white supremacy every day. And, you know, speaking for myself, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm an African descendant, you know, Uh, Puerto Ricans are African descendants. Dominicans are African. Most Latinos are African descendants. And there is a, movement that of people that are waking up to that reality. And then you have Hebrew Israelites coming along, you know, uh, trying to gather these people up. It makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. It's a strategic move. You want your numbers to grow? I don't know if this is intentional or not, you know, uh, but, you know, it's there's a huge segment of people who, who 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 are in the black collective that are waking up to this reality, and we need to define that reality. We need to be the mm-hmm. ones to to open the doors to that reality and explain it, teach it, and 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 bring them into the fold when they're ready. Can You're I say something? Right. Absolutely. Go ahead. One of the things I think. One one of the things I found to you know coming mm-hmm. from the background that I that I have is that with the black church is afraid to call themselves the black church. And and what happened to us was we well. bought into we well well we bought into this whole idea of multicultural ministry. And so if if you if you look at many of your more successful ministries, they don't focus on that. They just do what they do wherever they are and if it appeals to people, then it appeals to people and people come. But they don't go out of their way, for the most part, to try and do this whole thing. Now, that was a thing for a while. But what I saw was that most of the the church ministries that were on this multicultural church ministry kick, it were primarily black churches. Now, we know that the church of Jesus Christ or the church of God, it doesn't have such a label. But the reason why I use the label is because... It was the label that was created not by us, but it was created out of the fact that when black slaves or black people tried to congregate with white Christians, they were barred and denied and told, go start your own. And, and that label was created because of that separation and that segregation and the continual racism. And so one of, so one of the things that the black church especially in America, or anywhere has to do is not be afraid to be the black church. And that means True. not be afraid to cater to black people about their culture and their history and not try to conform so much and adopt the ways of other people because we think that's how you do successful ministry. No, because it, it, in the time and day that we're living in, where we're seeing the kind of things that are going on right before our eyes, the uh, other people are being un- unapologetically racist or whoever they are, and they don't really care how they feel. Ever since I moved to Georgia, one thing I can say is there's racism here. I knew it was here in the South, but, but, yeah, but they're yeah, very nice yeah. about their racism because, yeah. you know, they will smile at you, feed you, show you all the ho- Southern hospitality that you believe the South would and still be racist and not care whether you like it or not. Right. So the thing about it is we can't be ashamed to love the Lord and also be black because there's something that he's uniquely gifted our culture with and our people with that we cannot separate from our religious experiences or our spirituality. 
And we need to embrace that and accept that in its totality and never let it go or be ashamed of it. And we need to also teach that in these ministries to our people without being afraid of who we're going to offend. There we go. Agreed. There we go. (laughs) This this, this, this is the question, though, that because I have anger issues. Uh, (laughs) Just to be that's one of the reasons why I tend not to get into a lot of online debates and back and forth with people because I don't like to have conversations with adults where there's snarkiness, there's an overabundance of sarcasm, and, you know, they just take unnecessary shots at you. I, I don't like that type of stuff, so I usually try to stay <laughs> away from those type of discussions and those type of people who want to have those discussions. So I don't talk to Hebrew Israelites on social media pretty much at all, just because they do things that get my blood pressure up. But the Boy. one question that I have to ask y'all is, and I know y'all know, and I, you know what, I don't know how AO does it. I tell you, because that brother right there. <laughs> anyway, why would folks want to serve and love a God that they believe cursed them? I just can't, for the life of me, understand how you can love and serve someone who you believe every day beating you down keeping you in a negative situation, having the people being shot down the street, having you underneath all types of social economic oppression, but you love and serve this dude. Help me understand that. And I say dude intentionally because I believe they're serving and pushing a false God and a false ideology. Help me understand. Why would we well, want yeah, to I... Please, somebody. Brittany, go ahead, because I know. Yeah, Brittany, go you, ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Help me <laughs> Yeah, I be, to me it's it's like a righteous suffering because that whole nationality, that whole heritage, it's like because I'm an Israelite, because I am a part of this chosen nation, you know, so in in some kind of way they you know twisted it and conformed it to where they are able to um be able to deal with all this craziness that's taking place. Like, I'm suffering because God wants me to suffer. I'm cursed because, you know, God cursed me. So it's like this whole righteous type thing, this whole heritage that they, you know, proclaim all the time. I believe that gives them the mentality to accept being cursed, you know, and to want to serve a God that just is stuck on, you know, whooping them at every moment. <laughs> but there are little now, let me... to believe that the transatlantic slave trade was something that God used or put in place in order for us to come closer and to be drawn closer to who he is. I just Hold I on. don't understand that type of rationale and thought process at I'm... all, DC. I don't yeah, it I'm going to tell you. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. Now y'all that's how y'all are thinking about it, right? But y'all not <laughs> forgive me, but I'm going to speak to you how Hebrew told me, right? Isaiah forty five seven. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I the Lord do all these things. That verse right there is basically the whole paradigm that God has ordained. All this, all the good and all the evil. Since he knows everything, they believe in an omniscient God. They believe that he knows everything, past, present, and future, right? Because they believe that, that's what they believe the Bible uh, teaches, right? If you say, if you say what you said, you have a problem with God. That is your problem, right? You're trying to shirk out of the punishment period, right? And I have dialogued with many Hebrews, right? Now, if you say, if you say, if I said what they said to them and I identify as a Christian, I'm automatically a coon. But if I say what they say, it's just taking responsibility. 
You're just taking responsibility for the sins of your ancestors. And that is the mentality that people have with it. If we don't... I'm a cool... Because I want to build up my people and instead of them being killed. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. (laughs) You're not a coon because of that. You're not a coon because of that. You're a coon because one, you're not recognizing your Israelite identity. That's one of the things. That's one of the things that you'll be called. And then the other thing is that somebody won't call you a coon, but they will tell you you're trying to, you're trying to shirk away from God. Right, you're trying to not obey the commandment. You're trying to get out of, you're trying to get out of the punishment period, right? And God hasn't ordained it. That's why ha- that's why everything hasn't worked, right? If everything hasn't worked, nobody would be able to stop us. Nobody would be able to stop us if <laughs> if God was on our side, right? Nobody would be able to stop us. But that Isaiah forty five seven, that isn't. Oh, boy, and I hate to say it, I don't, I don't think the scriptures teach that God was just trying to curse Israel. Now, in the certain situations, yeah, they did get cursed because of things that they broke, laws that they broke, people that they oppressed, right? But God didn't wait 3,000 years later to fulfill a prophecy he said to the ancient Israelites, he didn't wait that long. Why would that make sense? Why would that make sense? All you've and and if you even think about it further, all the people would have all Israelites would have known was oppression, right? If you're still under that old covenant, right? According to what they teach, you're just going to go in and out of oppression. If you're not keeping that law perfectly, right? If you're not keeping that law perfectly, then what's the point of even Christ dying for you? Why did he even die? What's the what's the point? Why you believe why do you believe in the Messiah and you still oppressed? You still oppressed. And that's something the old test that's some the old testament only Israelites tell others. They're like, Man, that, that man, that New Testament, man, that ain't that thing ain't no good, man, because we still oppressed. Because even they hold to the Deuteronomy twenty eight. And you know, you mentioned the suffering aspect that is appealing. And there's many things that we said that are appealing to us as a community that the Israelites give out or push out. And I'm telling you, one of the things that I think that we're overlooking is the appeal of suffering. In our yeah. community, unfortunately, suffering in many ways is a badge of honor. It's just looked at as some, and I can't explain it, that the more you the more pain you went through, the more scars, the more heartbreak that you have. Somehow yeah. you get placed on this insane hierarchy in our community where you look at as something of great significance because you have gotten suffering down to a science. The struggle Olympics, man. That's what it is. Listen, <laughs> in our and just hey, well, it doesn't and kill you, it makes you stronger, right? Listen, yeah. only God can judge me, one can only kill all those cliches that we throw out as a people, that just and it goes along with this, this whole trauma narrative that we've been seeing lately that I don't even think we really understand what suffering is any longer. I don't think we really have a full grasp. So when we read things that Jesus has done in scriptures and he does it just looks so far fetched to us. It almost looks like science, just science fiction and just something that is straight out of a Disney catalog to see yeah. him loving people in that way. It's just, it's just like, how can I love someone like that when I walk out my door at 5 o'clock in the morning that I have to look over my shoulder both ways, not for white supremacy to see if they're going to come get me, but my next-door neighbor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that and I'm I'm only going to make it short and then Brittany or Jose, you can take it over. But I think that definitely goes into like a fear, sort of a fear mentality. It's almost, it's all, it's almost like you're in an abusive relationship. It's like, man, you, yeah. you're just not behaving enough. You're just not behaving enough. Like if you would just behave, 
right, then none of this stuff would happen to you, all right? If you would just act right, you know, if black people weren't out here, if y'all didn't go out here getting drunk, being alcoholics, if you guys weren't so focused on killing your own people, if you weren't out here selling drugs, if you weren't out here trying to uh, destroy families and just being basically heathens, right? And if these Christians weren't out here worshiping these pagan idols, right, which a lot of it derives from the heat, which, which a lot of these practices we see, some of them are pagan, and then some of them are, some of them really are derived from a mix of traditions that we've had as African people, and then some some of the stuff that comes from uh, the Hebrews back back through time. But the point being is that you're not being obedient enough. You're not obedient enough, and that's why you can't win. You will never win if you're not obedient enough, right? Some people believe that Jesus is coming back in 2019, and if you're a Hebrew and you're listening to the show and you believe that, I'm telling you right now, for your own sake, when that happens, we welcome you with open arms to under like to understand like that's that that might not happen. That might not happen. And when that doesn't happen, you have to readdress everything you've been teaching about the prophecies, the quote unquote prophecies. But some of these things aren't prophecies, right? You have to re examine the way you've been teaching yourself to read the Bible. So I just wanna not all Hebrews believe that, that's just for the Hebrews that do. Now, all of that said that's my point. I think that we have been accustomed to being afraid of God, right? We're we, like, like this is an oppressive God because we're so used to it. We, it's like, man, it must be God. So that's my, that's my intake on that. And Jose, it, yeah. it makes sense. Jose, it makes sense that black Hebrew Israelites look at us, particular people who were talking about affirming blackness, uh, not to be fearful in their relationship with Christ. It makes sense that they view us as prideful in operating by the flesh. It, it makes total sense that they would view us like that. But it's almost like you either accept a defeatist attitude or you're ostracized. You, you, you're just cast away. And I'm trying to understand how what part of us as a people have bought, how do we buy into that narrative of being defeated like that all the time? Oh man. I mean, it's just the reality of everyday life. I mean, it's, you know, it takes, it takes a lot to, to strengthen your thought process, your mind every day to not believe the messages that are being sent your way, you know? Um, and, uh, in, in a lot of ways, if you're that kind of person, you know, you're, it's a very lonely road. I, I, you know, um, you know, you, you just scroll through Facebook. I mean, you know, no. black bodies, you know, uh, people's lives are just, not esteemed they're not they're not valued and you don't have to be long on on your facebook feed to see that you know a per, a, a black person speaks out um they're attacked in every single direction and sadly from their very own i mean defeatist you know it's easy to be that way i think it's the easiest route i think what we're proposing is 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 a tough is a tough sell because we're telling people to do the exact opposite that 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 the that the current that the river of right white supremacy is is pushing you know we're 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 walking up upstream against a very strong current and so you know I'm 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 not going to try to paint a rosy picture of this but you know uh what we're trying to do here at BEC we're trying to build a community you know, of people that who are going to encourage and empower one another. Um, it's, uh, we're the few, you know, and, uh, we're going to do that by pointing, uh, back towards, um, towards our roots to embrace who we are. Um, it's going to, it's going to be a slow process of learning and growing together, 
It's going to be organic. It's going to be real. Um, it's not going to be. Um, it's not going to be easy. So, yeah, you can go with the flow and have a defeatist mentality, in my view, or you can do something about it. Um, you can stand up, embrace who you are instead of rejecting and changing the narrative in, a, in a, what I think is a superficial and artificial way, um, an unbiblical way, in my view. Um, so, yeah, come, come, come this way. We'll, we'll embrace any Hebrew Israelite who listens to this show, is let down by, uh, you know, the rhetoric and, and uh, the ideology that they're embracing now. Um, and, 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 and we're here. We're here. We're not going anywhere. Go ahead, Brittany. Yeah, I think the whole Hebrew Israelite ideology fits along. Like um, Mufadisi was saying, what must I do, you know, to remove the suffering? And that just really plays out in our community as a whole. You know, with all these cop shootings, I believe there's this video going around, okay, this is how you're supposed to act when you get pulled over, you know, as we go into the workplace as a black person, this is how you're supposed to act. So we're always doing these things to, you know, appeal and to be acceptance, always put in this obedient state of what do I have to do to make things right? Even though I didn't do anything wrong, you know, it's always, okay, what, what can I do? So I believe this whole Hebrew Israelite thing of turning back to the Torah, obedience falls in line with that. What can I do to stop? How how much more can I obey in order to stop this suffering that's taking place? And I think the thing that bothers me is yeah, there's things about the Hebrew Israelites that we can say are positive, uh, you know, tricks that we wish that more black Christians would pick up. But even as I'm sitting here listening to us talking about the fear and being viewed as prideful and operating in the flesh and, you know, us being disobedient and, and maybe we need to be obedient to a set of rules and and morals and things, it, there's a lot of, unfortunately, black Christians who have a fear-based relationship with Christ, that Man, their what? whole idea of a relationship with Christ is based off of this notion that every mistake, every sin, every wrongdoing, that God is just sitting on a throne waiting to bust them upside the head with a lightning bolt, you know, and that True. a certain number of those sins is going to lead them into damnation. And when you hear people like us here at BEC, and this is not some humble boast or humble brag, but when you hear people who are willing to affirm their blackness, proclaim an unadulterated view and version of Christ, that is an affront to those who are in the Hebrew Israelites and many within the church. Because it goes countercultural to everything that has been taught, unfortunately. There's this notion and this view that's taking place right now within the church that's, you know, we, we've got to be a certain way. We've got to do a certain thing. We, we have to live a certain life. we, we got to buy into holiness. We have to do all these things. Yeah. And you have all these people who are literally afraid to live. Yeah. 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 But I believe blackness has always been radical. I sorry. But blackness no, no, has always going, been going. Yeah, keep has going. always been radical. It's always been like taboo, you know, to embrace who you are, you know. Um you, what was that? I believe it was some law that was put out, you know, where dreads were not accepted in the military. Yeah. So anything yeah. that symbolizes who you are ethnically is, you know, we have laws against it indirectly, you know, told it, tone it down, you know, put that afro away, <laughs> um, you know, just various things. So, you know, that's why in their eyes, BEC, you know, oh, yeah, we're definitely rebellious, defiant people, you know, trying to get out of this punishment. So I think it just fits <laughs> along with that narrative of blackness and people 
taking power into their own hands, liberated people taking power into their own hands to carry out their liberation fully. And I mean, we're just embracing what the scriptures teach. You know, we're free in Christ. You know, I mean, the Imago Dei, the beautiness of Christ, of what God has, you know, made us in his image. You know, nothing that we're saying is, you know, heresy or unbiblical. But because it hasn't been taught, because it hasn't been embraced, again, we get put within the likes of Louis Farrakhan, you know. Yeah. (laughs) So. It's abrasive in a white supremacist system. It's abrasive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now let me let me let me let me you you, you communicate the spirit of Luke four eighteen and the reason Jesus came. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed to set free the oppressed. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're not talking about setting free oppressed people, what are we talking about? What are we really doing? Right. I mean, at the end of the day, the gospel was supposed to be the Jesus that I read about was a revolutionary. He didn't even want, he didn't even, he didn't want the Israelites under Roman occupation. He wasn't going to the poor people saying, oh, y'all deserve for this to be happening to you. He didn't walk, he didn't walk in there. He didn't, even, he, didn't even, he didn't tell his own people that. What he said, he said, I'm coming to... I'm coming to the sick. I'm coming to the captive. I'm coming to the poor, the downtrodden, the people that have been oppressed. I'm coming to those people and saying, hey, this is how we got to get out, right? And when he died, that symbolism, the symbolism is that for us as black people, the message we can take is, man, you can go out. I'm going out fighting. I'm going out fighting. I'm not going out trying to kill. No, I'm not trying to kill nobody. I'm just trying to set, I'm just trying to do the right thing. And I think that for me, the Christianity that I've grown up with was about was about that understanding that in our context and our times today, it's not the same as what Jesus had to go through. It's not the same thing. We don't live in those same contexts. We don't live in the same context as Deuteronomy, right? We don't live in the Bronze Age anymore, right? We we have things that we have to deal with on a systematic level. That is very complex, and that is complex answers to them. And so I think I think Brittany brought up uh, an amazing point in how blackness is radical. Like we're supposed to be radical. There's no other. I don't think for us that there's any way of living other than to. But there's no other way for us to really experience what life is. We can't experience life under the under under white supremacy. You're not going to. You, we don't have that mental freedom. We don't have that peace. So the only peace that we would be able to find is we got to fight. You got to fight. Yeah. And the church, right. for us, we got to be on the streets. We have to, we have to be amongst the people. You know, it can't, it can't just keep being. Here on BEC, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're spreading an ideological thought to change the landscape of the black church, right? Uh, we want this yeah. on the ground, right? We need the people. They need to see the faces, right? The people with the ideology, let them know that, oh, you guys are here. We're spreading that message. You guys are living what you're about. You're fighting against gentrification. You're fighting against the racism on the job. You're fighting against every single system that promotes that, every single institution. And you keep fighting until the fight is won, just period. And I know we started off the show, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone who is listening now and will be listening later. We started off the show highlighting the purpose of discussing the Kendrick Lamar album. But the key thing is to understand is there is some responsibility on our part as black Christians to proclaim the appropriate image of Christ. And unfortunately, we live in a society in an area of the world where Christianity is so westernized, so Europeanized, that it has changed the way that we as a people view each other. When we were once communal, Mm. now we're incredibly individualistic. And that is a direct product of 
white evangelicalism because white evangelicalism is directly connected and has its ties into white supremacy. It teaches a personal relationship with Jesus. It's, it's my own. It, it's no longer about me loving my neighbor. It's about making sure that I'm taking care of myself and hoarding all my resources for myself. And that goes completely yeah. countercultural with who Jesus was. One who did what? Gave not only everything, but also gave himself. And against who and it goes we against are. the scripture. Yeah. It goes against the scripture. I mean, you weren't even able, like, you can't participate in the Lord's Supper, this communal meal, without fixing the right against your brother or sister in the body. Like, you can't mm. even give your offering if there was some wrong taking place. So it's like, how many. Yeah. <laughs> now you're crazy. Right. No, you're right. Jose, what were you going to say? No, I agreed. I think, you know, everyone's saying it's against scripture and, uh, and I, you know, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. I just mentioned that it's against who we are as a people, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, we have to become wholly other to ourselves. Um, you know, in order to embrace that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is a great place to shut this broadcast down. But before I do, I'm going to ask each one of the hosts to give their final thoughts. Um, your final thoughts doesn't specifically have to be connected to tonight's topic. It can be anything that is on your heart relating to our relationship and the things that we should be doing in regards to Luke 4.18. So I'm going to go first. Uh, my thought process is I need black Christians and the body of Christ to begin to develop ways where they can communicate their differences with grace, love, and compassion not with the intent of always agreeing or coming to an agreement, but to not further the divide that is already present. So what I would like to see is for us to begin to season our words, like the old saints would say, season your words with grace and be a little bit more compassionate with those that you do not hold the same as you point with. That ain't mean you got to yeah. be homies. You ain't got to kick it. You ain't got to eat some chicken together. But the one thing that you should be able to do is disagree in a loving manner. Next up. Um, I'll, I'll, I will add to that. that um, I, 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 I genuinely pray and hope that the black community um, finds, refines, and rekindles that black power spirit. Um, we're not talking about oppressed people. I understand, I understand the, the vitriol, the anger that people see from seeing their family members be killed. Um, I don't want to talk about that Facebook Live video that's been going around. I, I really don't, but I, I understand when it would, if people would say, look, I'm, I'm trying to get back at that dude, even though you know, I think he committed suicide. But the point is that anger, that vitriol, that mental, the mental health of our own people, that has to be addressed and that I think that we as a church we can provide those answers by being the community in which people can be healed right we can be a place an environment where we don't condemn people with a uh, depression right we don't condemn people we seek to understand what it is we seek to help them understand what it is we don't just pray we send them we send them to help Right, that that type of stuff. So I, I I pray that I pray that that Black Power movement ideology would be um, spread into our communities. I I really hope that we 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 as BEC people that we hold to it and that we hold other people to it and that we implement it in our own local community. So that's my that's my last two cents. Next. 
Yeah, I definitely would just uh, add on to uh, what Musa Desi was saying. It's just the black church has a perfect time to, you know, become active again or for those who have been doing this to continue on to really change this whole narrative of just being a pew sitting Christian of just assimilating and just accepting white supremacy. Like we really have the chance to combat all these various narratives and what we're doing, you know, is biblical. We're teaching about, you know, the liberation that, you know, comes through Christ. We're teaching about learning the cultural aspect of, you know, this historical narrative of the Bible that is presented to us, you know, of African people, the Israelites. So, um, yeah. So we definitely have a lot to do, but I am definitely hopeful um, and excited about what's to come, and I believe if we do what we need to do, we can definitely um, help to prevent people who get into all these various avenues, you know, thinking that they found what they were searching for, and they end up spiraling into all these various things that they never intended to get into. So really showing that Christ is the way. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's I think, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to share something that really helped me, um, you know, turning – you know, I, I, I like to say about most people like me uh, in terms of my ethnic community uh, that, you know, we don't know much more than our food, our flag, and our fiestas, you know. And I, I, I'm starting to see that played out, um, in, you know, in, across the black collective. And I feel that one of the ways to strengthen – um, and to fortify who we are is to really to return back to understanding who we are. And I've done that. I've taken that path along the way, shared my knowledge with others. And and it is something that just strengthens who you are and it leads you um, to back to where I feel like, you know, has gotten me to where I am today. And just knowing who I am, knowing, you know, uh, what's important. I, I feel like our, our ethnic, our cultural identity is so important. It's God given. I, I feel like it's one of the blessings that we have and the church does not encourage us to embrace that enough. And so that's my encouragement. I, I feel like if we can do that, you know, um, we're on a, we're on a path that, is pregnant with knowledge and intimacy with ourselves and with each other and with, with, with the Lord. There you have it. Uh, because he has dropped a couple of singles and he's one of the artists that, uh, he does that whole Beyonce thing. And when I say the Beyonce thing is truthfully, you have no idea when they're dropping an album. You don't know that they're dropping a dog on album until the dog on album is being played a lot of times. So he dropped a couple of singles and it was just like, oh, okay. Then you kind of got an understanding or an idea that an album was coming because he dropped so many singles in a row. Now I woke up in the morning and I'm like, okay, and, you know, I'm going to listen to this album on my, you know, on my commute to work. And I'm just like DC. I'm listening to the album and I'm like, man, this is good. Until I got to Yah. And once I got to the song Yah, it was just like, hmm, interesting. Because the word Yah, that title, is a, is a red flag for us. We, we know that when we hear Yah, it usually means, uh-oh, I need to pay attention closely to what's coming next. Now, what took place next was he began to talk about and mention a lot of black Hebrew Israelites rhetoric. Now, I'm going to actually have the folk from our apologetics team address the Israelite aspect. And then me and, you know, I'm going to bring Jose in and I want him to touch on 
this particular song, Fear, that really resonates and had a profound or it had a lot. And I think that was the way you can find the bulk of the Hebrew Israelites rhetoric on that particular song. So, so real quick, DC, break down as the best you can, man. Give the folk who may not have an understanding what the Hebrew Israelites believe. And I know that can be in, in, in depth. And just, just give them a little snippet because I want them to kind of understand why this particular album was so problematic to the body of Christ. Right. Right. Okay, so now for anybody who's listening, the first thing you have to realize is that just like anything within the black community, the beliefs of Hebrew Israelites are diverse, right? So not all Hebrew Israelites, a camp Israelite and a camp Israelite uh, ideologically and like someone who doesn't live in the camps, these are, those are two separate, those are two separate things. So when you're addressing those thought paradigms, it's all different. Is it, you have to come at things from a different angle. So the one thing they do all agree on, however, is that Deuteronomy 28 is basically a sign that a sign for us African Americans, not just us as African Americans, but you know some people hold to that the Native Americans and uh, you know sometimes Puerto Ricans. Uh, uh, I think I want to say the Spanish, Brittany. I don't. I don't I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, it just all but, depends, like you said, on which group. So Right. Right. So in any case in any case, yeah, it just depends on what, what type of group we're dealing with. But the one, the main commonality is that is that Deuteronomy twenty eight, the curses, black people fit them. The reason that we're in this situation, the reason that the slave trade happened is because we broke the laws and commandments and statutes of the Most High God, and because the, because we did that, that is why we're in this situation, right? We have tried, you know, black people have tried, you know, their movements, you know, we got the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, but the reason those things didn't work was because basically God wasn't on our side, right? As a collective, as a collective, you know, we've sinned, and we are still under those curses until we come back to those commandments, uh, and that's sort of what... Carl Duckworth was saying on, and when I say commandments, I'm talking about some people believe it's Torah, but I think some people believe it's uh, a living out of the new covenant. Uh, but I'm not sure the, on that one. I, I have to admit that I'm not sure how to what extent they since they believe. There's some personal research I got to do for that. But okay. in general, a lot of them believe you got to come back to Torah. You got to come back to living. In the way that uh, you keep the old feet, you keep the feast days that the uh, the Hebrews, the Bible keep. You keep uh, the way they wear the clothes. A lot of people, you know, they they wear. You talk about wearing fringes. You know, you gotta have. You know, if you got a beard, grow out your beard, right? <laughs> you no, know, stay away from that pork. I know y'all. I know. I know a lot of us. You know, you like you like them ham sandwiches and them pork chops, but nah, you can't can't do that anymore. But so it's stuff like that. It's stuff like that that we have to uh, that we have to uh, be wary of when you're uh, dealing with Hebrew Israelites, because that's really about one of the few places that they that camps anybody who's an Israelite across the board. That Deuteronomy 28 is a factor, and that's why and that's why it was important that K. Dot mentioned that because that's one thing they all agree with. Okay, now he did, on the album, he specifically said, I'm an Israelite. You know what I mean? He, he made it clear, right. I'm an Israelite, and he also stated of the, the curse of Deuteronomy 28. And I don't think people really understand how that curse affects black people specifically. Because my understanding of that curse essentially means and Brittany, correct me if I'm wrong, it means that we can do nothing to get out of our current plight in this country, that we're just stuck. Yeah, pretty much, like you said, that God had, or Yah, or for some, the Most High, basically has us 
you know, ordained to this very long cursed period. And any movement, as we see, Black Power Movement, um, Black Wall Street, any movement that black people have tried to come together and better themselves has failed because it has not ultimately freed black people over here from being oppressed. So, yeah. This is very problematic. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Jose, I want to bring Jose in here also. Jose, from a and, and I, I, I'm throwing some of the, the mental stuff at you because I know that's a field that you actually work in. Uh, so when we call you doctor, it's in jest, but recognize and appreciate that area that you're proficient in. When you have someone, a group of people who believe in curses, that basically that there's nothing they can do to get out of their current situation. What are some of the... Okay, interesting. I didn't know if, you know, we had any intro music tonight or not. I guess, you know, our wonderful uh, (laughs) benefactor, boss, CEO, uh, A.O. Green is, you know, he decided not to put a, you know, intro for us today. But I get enough for the music. But I get enough for the (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Big Al, Big Al, you don't need an introduction, man. (laughs) The people know you, man. You're absolutely right, man, (laughs) unfortunately. Uh, I just want to thank everybody, man, for tuning into this particular episode of DEC Media. This particular broadcast would be what we call the Convocation. That's when we bring all of uh, an assortment of members of the BEC media team to come together and tackle a topic. Usually that topic is something that is incredibly pressing and has to be addressed immediately. So it's an all-hands-on-deck type of affair for this broadcast, man. So I'm going to do some quick intros, and then we're going to dig into the purpose of the broadcast for you guys who do not know me, my name is Elgin Bailey. I go by Big L. I am the host of BEC Radio. You can catch me on Monday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Also with me tonight, I have the host of Black Urban Apologetics. Infidisi is in the building with us, and his partner in crime, Brittany, is with us also. And we cannot forget... The, 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 the doctor, even though you probably just want to correct me for calling him doctor, we got our brother, our wonderful brother, Jose, is in the building, man. Briefly, would everybody say hello and maybe say a couple words and we'll move forward? Go ahead, DC. You started out, brother. All right. Uh, what's going on, folks? Uh, I mean, Elgin pretty much gave a pretty good introduction. Uh, I'm just looking forward to having this conversation, man. Uh, I think we got I think we got a lot to break down. And I think we're gonna cover it in some ways that uh people ain't really uh people not really uh expecting. So um yeah man, I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm excited to be here. Sure. Brittany, what's on your mind? You're next. Uh what's good, y'all? This is Miss Brittany. I'm definitely glad to be here for this convocation with all my brothers. <laughs> um she is the like Miss Phoebe stated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, holding it down. Um, right, but I'm definitely glad. You know, this is definitely a hot topic. You know, in social media, so I'm glad that we are tackling it from all these various perspectives. You know, apologetics, social issues. You know, with Big L, and then of course the doctor to break it all down <laughs> for us. So <laughs> definitely glad to be oh, here. Man. Yeah, that was no pressure, Jose. No pressure, brother. Yeah, <laughs> just to be clear, I am just Jose. I, I, am, I am glad to be here as well. No doctor, no MD, no PhD, no PsyD, no, none of that behind my my name. But uh, but uh, I, I appreciate the respect. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh man, loquacious Latino trying to be uh, humble. Come on, bro. He's trying, he's trying to be a little humble. Okay, okay, now. <laughs> is, it, is it working? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah not, not really. He said, is it working? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, tonight's topic, um, we, we actually haven't given it to you yet, but once you hear what the topic is, you're automatically, uh, your ears should perk up, and I'm sure that you'll have some thoughts around this particular subject. The title of tonight's broadcast is called K Dots, The Curse and the Church, Misdefining Reality. I'm going to say it one more time for you. K Dot, The Curse and the Church, Misdefining Reality. If anybody, I don't know where you could be living at, if you did not know that uh, this week, hip hop artist Kendrick Lamar dropped a new album. Uh, the title of the album is called Damn. But in the in the particular album, there were some things that stuck out to us that, that caught our attention right away. And that kind of leads into the purpose of this particular broadcast. The purpose of this particular broadcast is to have an open, honest, and transparent discussion about not only the album, but the effects of some of the things that were said on the album, the response of the body of Christ, and also the effects of this propaganda on the black church. Okay? Now let's dig right in. Let's let's talk about the actual album. DC, where, where were you when you first heard that the album dropped? What was your initial response when you heard it? Let's talk about the album. Uh, man, I was asleep. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember, like, cause it was, I, it was about twelve. I remember it was about twelve midnight when it dropped, and I was tired, coming off of work. I wake up six in the morning, and I see all like I'm seeing everybody blow up, talking about, oh man, uh, Kendrick the sense of he he done woke up. I was like, woke up. I was like, I was, I was real confused, and then I started getting uh. I started getting messages, started getting messages, and so I started listening to the album. And I liked it. I actually liked the album as a project. I mean, I ain't got no, I don't have any issue with it. Um, it was just I heard some things on there, and based off of my experience, I kind of, I kind of cringed up a little bit. I'm I'm in my house, like listening to it, like I'm bumping DNA, and I was cool. Then I hit y'all, and I was like, uh. Uh, I kind of I had to stop. I had to stop for a bit. I was like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. He said that. So, I, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's basically what happened with me. I I, I kind of had a pause on it, and then I was like, uh, this is this is kind of this is kind of big because a lot of people listen to Kendrick. What Kendrick? I ain't gonna say what Kendrick say, says goes, but you know we we kind of take what Kendrick says and then we kind of run with it. With a lot yeah, of stuff, yeah. so that's that's kind of that's kind of where I was when I heard it. Okay, okay. Now, Brit, you said you listened to a couple of the songs on the album. What was your initial thoughts when you heard the album? Uh, when I heard these few songs, definitely was not expecting this at all. Especially um, hearing the song "Humble" that came out before the album, definitely mm. was not thinking he was going to go, you know, this route with the whole Hebrew-Israelite thing. So I, w- I was taken by surprise. So When I heard the album, I knew the album was dropping. And, that, and saying that, you know, those white people up over there in Israel today, you know, they, they paint this picture of, you know, the Bible being Eurocentric, but really we are the people that the Bible is speaking about. We are the Israelites, you know, so you go from what has, you know, in place at the bottom to, you know, to the top in a sense, and definitely picking back off of what DC was saying, as in, you know, here at BEC, you know, to fight white supremacy, you know, we say economics, uh, education, various sorts of things, in their way, in a sense, to fight oppression is just returning back to the laws. So, in a sense, they're not really fighting oppression. So. 
And it's, to, to me, when I hear them say things like returning back to the law, it's, it's, it's a very double-minded, double-tongued thought process. Because in one direction, you're telling me not to do anything. But on the other side, you're telling me that I need to do something to get to a place where I don't have to do anything. It's really convoluted and confusing. And what you notice, family, is the fact of this movement, this thing, this, this Israelite Hebrew thing is booming all of a sudden. I mean, I live here in Philly, and there's this one strip, of, this one street that is well known that it's, if you're going to go shopping here, you always have to be in mind that you're going to be harassed by the Israelites it's somehow, some way. Either they're going to be mm. passing out pamphlets or they're going to be with the megaphone talking about white devils and doing all this sort of things. But from street, now all through my community, black Hebrew Israelites are everywhere. I mean, yeah. it is everywhere, and I think that's one of the most problematic, dangerous things about what Kendrick did on this album, that he has the freedom of expression to say what he believes and what his belief system is on his records. But still, nonetheless, no one can actually take away the dangerous propaganda, because that's what it is. It's propaganda that's put on there. But where did this rise? Hebrew Israelites come from all of a sudden. What in the world has caused this rise of the Hebrew Israelites to just boom the way it's booming now? What in the world happened? Uh, Anybody? Uh, Anybody? Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, this is, I would just say it like it is. This is on, these are black people, and a black church is responsible for. for for black people, and that's how I, that's how I've always viewed it. And so this is our fault, like because as a whole, as a whole, I'm not now to be clear. Before I start, before, I, before somebody listening is like, oh, you know, you don't like you don't like uh, black churches, institutional churches. I go to a church <laughs> down in D.C. I go to a church down in D.C. and I know that a lot of my members, until I brought it home. Right, they didn't know about it. They didn't know about it. The pastor knows about it, but not everybody else knows about it. Why is that? Because a lot of times you have people who are sitting there in the pews. You know, you, you might have people like that aren't really interested, don't see the need to address these type of things, or you have the people. You even got them in D.C. You got people on the streets that are down there in D.C. that that uh promote that right you got IUIC camps down in DC you have we have we had IUIC uh camps there's a IUIC camps in the DMV area just period so for us i think that we're not dealing a lot of times you can't find a church that deals with this whole racism that we see in America. Like, oh, man, I, I don't have the answers, and I don't really see the church doing anything. So when a black church Christian comes along, it's like, hey, wait a minute, hold on. Now, we have people that dealt with this stuff in the past. It's just a lot of us don't know about it. I think it's the fault of us not systematically educating uh, the people. I'm sorry to say it, but we got a lot of jack-led preachers out there, a lot of jack-led, boot-led preachers just trying to get a quick buck just trying to have some sort of influence over people where they don't really care about the black community or even how to overcome the racism, right? How to overcome the white supremacy, the ideology, you know, how to, how to overcome these situations like people got to face on their job. Right. And I think it's so important for the black church to say to black people, this is not your fault. There's there's nothing that you did that makes them like this. Right. God isn't like sitting there like, and you guys are not obedient enough, so I'm gonna send these white people down your neck to to basically punish y'all until y'all want to act right. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. We understand. We understand. You understand white supremacy. You understand. You see it. You see how the rules change for black people all the time in this country. In a black church, 
ought to be on the forefront and have a prophetic voice into how to deal with these issues, right? How to how to be a solution and a light to progress against those issues. You can't say you can't, and that's and I'm gonna pass it off to you, Brittany. After I say this, you can't go to a Hebrew and say you're not cursed and not understand white supremacy because you're gonna because automatically with that they are they automatically know oh you don't even care about the black community and that's the perception you got to deal with and that's what a lot of people don't understand that's what that's why that's why when you get some people like oh well you know how do you explain the fact that you know we got all this police brutality and all this stuff and you know we got all these problems in the community you know what you mean we not what do you mean we're not cursed right if you it's usually folks that have been so well taught, not well taught by white supremacy, but so familiar with it. I'm so used to seeing this stuff, this cycle. It's like a, it's like I just got to the point where, man, God must have a reason for, for this. So that, that, that's what I think. You can go ahead and take that, Brittany. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, the black church has not highlighted and fully broken down and analyzed, you know, the effects of systematic white supremacy that even, you know, affects the view of the black church as being second Mm. class. So, you know, and we don't really have examples out there of, you know, being Christian and being able to embrace, you know, blackness to embrace your African identity if it is done. The, the, the problems that can possibly come from the people, for me it seems like it would just be this ultimate defeatist attitude. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a defeatist attitude, but, you know, the psyche has a way of finding um, some relief uh, when it comes to to uh, overcoming um a personality or an uh, an identity, rather, um, of oppression. Like, what could be more, um, you know, I read some of the lyrics, and, and, you know, Kendrick says, don't call me black, call me Hebrew Israelite, or something along those lines of paraphrasing. That's what stuck out to me the most. And, there, you know, there there's a payoff, um, in my view, uh, to... Um, redefining who you are from being a black person or a black Christian or whoever, because what's the narrative for black people in this country? What's the narrative? I mean, the narrative is, is oppression. And that's something that's a really, that's a really difficult thing to live with day in and day out. So there's an ethno, I, I, I say an ethnocultural appeal um, to, moving from a black identity characterized by oppression to a Hebrew Israelite identity where you're literally moving from an oppressed identity to, to being in control of your future. The narrative literally changes. It literally changes from oppression to imminent victory. Um, and there's something to be said about that. There's something to be said about not wanting to be characterized by oppression by oppression Mm -hmm. another thing i would add to that big l is is that there's an ancient appeal um you know my culture you know i I, i'm boricua uh most will say puerto rican um and even within my own cultural group um you know puerto ricans have faced a lot of oppression um as a you know as as a people group and there is a, a historic and ancient appeal to, 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 to become a, another um, identity. Um, some go to be becoming Taino, which is the, the original peoples of, of, of Puerto Rico. But I, the reason why I bring that up is that when you move from being black to being Hebrew Israel, Israelite, that appeal gives you something that's historic but also fresh and new within this context. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a specialness. There's a specialness that being a Hebrew Israelite gives you a sense of acceptance by a group. Um, There's a sense of belonging to a group Mm. that lives by a code, a law, 
um, that's uh, it gives you a sense of confidence that you can do right. this, that there's something very right. specific that you can do. Um, so you get that sense of confidence. There's also, I would say, um, a, a sense of equity or justice. You clearly understand why you're suffering, where in, in being black in America, if you're not woke to white yeah. supremacy, mm. It can be very vague and nebulous and, and hard to pinpoint other than your, your, the color of your skin. And that's hard to, that's hard to accept. And, that's, and again, that identity piece, that significant piece, I'm special. I'm Hebrew mm-hmm. Israelite. Right. Wow. And it's not only that. It, it, you go, go from – Yeah. So it, 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 it's really easy to piggyback off of that. So, one, it's not only just the special. Like, you are the most special, right? You are, right. You are the most chosen by God. Right. It, it goes from a literal, uh, it's a shift from a metaphorical sense in the way, you know, the black church, it's a sense from a, from a metaphorical way that the black church has viewed themselves in comparison to the Israelites to a very literal sense. So for Hebrew Israelites, a lot of them don't see it as they don't, they're not trying to do anything. Right, it, it, I've had conversations with a lot of Hebrews where it's like, it's not a matter of them not trying to be out here, not trying to be out in these streets, not trying to help their people, because they're very much concerned about that. However, the solution, the solution, we can't get out of the curses until we get back to these laws and commandments, period, as a collective. Until we get back to these laws and commandments, it's always going to be like this. So it's it's almost right. like, it's almost like a very... So I would say, look, switch out going to church. Let's say you're a heavy church goer, right? And you go to all the you go to all the Bible studies, you go to all the Easter Sundays, you go, you know, Christmas, you setting up all these programs. So throw all that out. Throw all that out, all the pagan holidays, you know. So there ain't no more Christmas, ain't no more it depending on how people believe, ain't no more Easter. You know what I mean? You have to do stuff from the Hebraic perspective the way God called it to be. And that's how they and that's how they view the movement, the the action, right. the work that we have to do to Let me add something to, to what you're just saying there, uh, D C is, is that literally if you're if you remain remain black, and let's just say black Christian, because I, 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 I tend to think probably most of these folk are coming from Christianity. Um <laughs> Where, where's the, where's, it's more of the same if you don't make that change. It's like you don't know where um, the way out is. It's, it's literally the church, the institutional church, has not really cleared a path to victory um, that, that is palpable for the black Christian. And I think that this shift from to Hebrew Israel, this Hebrew Israelite shift is a literal change in the narrative. And as you said, DC, what, so well, it moves from being special to being the most special. You're, re, you're literally renouncing oppression and you're taking on a clear, palpable path to victory. And that's, that's through living in a certain way, um, the Torah, the law, how, whatever you want to call it. Right. I would agree. Why don't you bring that on to that, Brittany? Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Oh, but yeah, I disagree with what Jose was saying, as in turning the table of oppression when you think about blacks here in America, you know, always deemed as inferior, less than. You know, we had a law that. You know, when we first came here, we were property, you know, then became three-fifths, and then we were freed, and then we finally became citizens. So uh, this whole storyline, you know, of oppression, it's really turning the tables on, you know, it's labeled uh, liberation theology or, you know, some type of social justice warrior. So the space hasn't been allowed that this good news that was supposed to go out to every nation, tribe, and tongue, 
you know, when people express their, you know, faith in God through their ethnic mm-hmm. identity, you know, it's silenced or, you know, hey, let's focus on the gospel. But they never really say, okay, what is the gospel, you know? It's like, you know, it's like sit down and be quiet. So uh, with the whole ethnic idea why this album from Kendrick is so problematic because, you know, the the black church has been silent and this black Hebrew Israelite which movement which has been seen and heard, you know, like you said, on the street corner, you pass by their schools and, you know, while you're driving through the neighborhood, social media uh, platforms, you know, but now you're having on a mass scale someone talking about heritage, something that is, you know, not talked about in the black church. Now you have these black Hebrew Israelites talking about heritage. So it's going to be very, you know, very, very appealing, you know, even though Kendrick doesn't go into the uh, details of how dangerous this mentality is when essentially you're saying that black people are responsible for, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and what happened uh, during slavery and Jim Crow, you know. So, and then also, just another social issue um, outside of ethnic identity, the black Hebrew Israelites, they really esteem black males. So, you know, in the black church, sometimes you have where it's basically like a woman's club, you know, and the only males you have yeah. are is the pastor and the elders, and then you have all these women and children. And then, you know, you may have a brother who is an usher. So really the only men esteemed in church, you know, biblical manhood is, you know, if you're a preacher, preacher in training, or, you know, an usher. So, you know, with men not being, biblical manhood not being esteemed all throughout the church, however a man, you know, serves God, you know, the Hebrew Israelites, they, you know, uh, they fill that gap that the church has failed to fill. So now you have these men who are, you know, it's your responsibility to lead your family, you know, your responsibility for the protection and the providing of not only your family, but the community and of these laws, you know. So it's various factors, you know, but ultimately it's, you know, various factors that the black church has uh, failed to do. And I think the one thing is, Jose, because I want to get your uh, your thoughts on this aspect. The, the, the black church specifically, we're going to just talk about that for just a moment, has, for whatever reason, since the civil rights movement, been incredibly reactive. We have not been nearly as proactive to social ills and things that are going on in our community. Uh, just in your opinion, just some of your thoughts, what can be some of the reasons why, and not only the reasons why, but some of the dangers of the church not being proactive? Oh, man, that's such a big question. I mean, so many layers to that. Uh, you know, when you're reactive, I, I almost envision and just – you know, from my experience um, and being uh, a part of several different types of churches um, that have a common thread of being reactionary, it's because they're not really they're the best. They're trying to hold on. Um, resources can be very challenging in our community, um, and so, like, even if the you know, your instinct is to do something. Even if you're the kind of person who's looking for opportunities to be proactive, you're limited by your resources. And so, you know, and and I think this is a small percentage, uh, at least that's my opinion, of people who want to address certain issues proactively. Um, Those are already a small percentage of of, of the rest. But then the reality of the resources is just not there. Um, so what are you left? What are you left to do? You're you're left to be there to hang on, to ride it out, to survive. Thriving's not thriving's not uh, a priority um, when you're barely keeping the lights on. 
you know. And that's not just the reality of the, you know, if you leave, if you leave, you're looking at that as, you know, as the reality of the institutional church within the black collective of the, the, the mm-hmm. limited resources. Um, but then you, you take and you follow those people home. The, mm-hmm. For the most part, you're seeing that there too. So mm-hmm. I'm not so sure that it's necessarily, um, you know, a failure of the black church, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very hesitant to say that because mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that the effects of white supremacy has really mm-hmm. crippled the, the ability for the black collective to be proactive in this. Um, mm. So, you know, basics of survival, you have to take care of the physical needs. You have to take care of the, the being able to survive thriving. That's, that's, that's not even in the picture, most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I absolutely agree with that. I know for a long period of time, I was a uh, real staunch uh, defender and fighter against the prosperity gospel. That I just, the prosperity gospel always has made my skin crawl and just had me incredibly angry. But then I began to look at the socioeconomic status and state of my community. The prosperity gospel makes perfect sense. It it makes complete Ah, sense. It is nothing more than a spiritual lottery. That's all it is. It makes perfect sense. But here's where one of the issues is, is the fact that the church has a real difficult time because of white supremacy. And because of the effects of white supremacy, unfortunately, defining reality. So many of the sermons and teachings that we hear every Sunday are no more than behavior modification. Just enough to get you motivated to make it to the next day. But it's not giving you enough to be able to actually make it through the week, if that makes sense. It hasn't done what it needed to do in the 